Learn behind glass, keep them safe, right? So then I went to college for computer college, and there we go. Did anybody have an acid loss dentist study? Yes, yeah, your focus. Who's got the acid loss and then a dentist study? Yeah. So yeah. So I went to computer college. Thought I was going to learn assembly. They weren't teaching assembly, so I'm like, this place sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was no course in video games. There was, you know, it was accounting and crap like that. So I didn't finish college. Um, but around this time, because I was working at the Radio Shack, at the, I got the Coco 3 when it came out, but at the same time, because I was in college and I was learning how to do things on the PC, I also got the first Tandy 1000. And I kind of became a PC guy since then. So I have a Tandy origin story. I started with Radio Shack, because I think a lot of people did, so I thought it was kind of cool that we're now here at Tandy Assembly all these years later. So that's kind of what got me into computers. Uh, I'm in IT. I think a lot of people, you, know, you started with computer back then. You, did a computer trade, so I think these are very common stories. Um, so that's where I began, and so where do we fast forward to? Uh, well, life went on, and uh, 2015 is when I started doing YouTube, and so uh, I had to like look all these dates up, right? So because of my kids wanted to play this game called Minecraft, I started doing stuff on YouTube. So in April, I started YouTube, um, and there's a lot of things you got to learn. There are a lot of things I learned along the way. Uh, my initial videos from Minecraft videos and maybe some arcade games running through the main emulator. And so that's just kind of where I got started. Um, when you get on YouTube, and if you want to grow an audience on YouTube, because you're not necessarily people aren't going to just find you automatically, you have to learn how to leverage social media as a marketing tool. And that's still an ongoing learning process, right? So here's my philosophy on internet marketing. If you build it, they might come. But if you spam the hell out of social media, you greatly increase those odds, right? And so all successful people are hosting things in multiple groups. <coughs> um, so um, yeah, but you got to do it, right? you got to do that because nobody's going to know, nobody's going to care. The best you can do is stick it in their face and maybe they'll click, maybe they won't. But if you're not putting it out there, nobody knows, right? So you got to become kind of a self-marketer. So uh, because I have worked in corporate America and I work in IT and, and a lot of my jobs have been in the world of digital publishing and like I was working on the Mac when desktop publishing was a new thing. None of these concepts were new to me so the idea of digital marketing is something I've been familiar with since like 89. So when I started this journey, I, I decided I need, a, I need a brand, I need a, you know, I need a, everything that a company would need. You need a logo, you need consistent artwork. And I even went as far as to make sure my domain name and the Twitter name and everything would not be in use because I figured branding, branding is important. So these are things I thought about before I even started and looked all this kind of stuff up. So I wanted to be consistent. I now have very nice artwork. I'm going to explain how and why I have that artwork now. I started off looking on the internet for stock images of artwork, right? It's been an interesting journey. And as I was putting together this presentation, I had to think about all the things that have been cool in these past two and a half years I've been doing this, and so I was able to squeeze stuff onto one slide. So I started YouTube in April, and the main reason why people found me was because of doing Tandy color computer videos that kind of put me on the map. So uh, my first Coco video I did in July of 2015, before I started doing a series, I figured nobody was going to know what this computer was, so I did a little PowerPoint saying, but here's the color computer. It was this thing that Radio Shack made, and you know, I tried to like explain what it was. I figured nobody would even know what I was talking about. So that was my first video in July. In September, I started doing color computer videos. I've got over 200 of them now, and so that's been just a fun ride playing the games. Um, I started on emulators. I had to learn a lot about emulation and that process. And then somebody told me about this thing called eBay which is a better website than Pornhub, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Spent a lot of time and money there. Um, and so my first Coco I bought, I don't have any of my original stuff. You know, as we all have probably regrets, right? So my first eBay, I got a Coco 2015. Being mentioned on the Coco Crew podcast, episode number six, uh, November 11th of 2015, was a big moment for me. It's kind of like, that's our radio now, the podcast. And so to hear yourself on the radio is a big thing, right? So that was kind of cool. Um, doing these videos, it's interesting what happens is that people find your videos, and people share your videos, people leave comments on your videos. Um, I've met and have become very good friends with Curtis Boyle in Canada. Curtis Boyle has a website. It's called the Color Computer Games List website. It's been around for well over five years. It's very well you known site, Curtis Boyle developed a Nitrous 9 operating system for the Coco, and so become good friends with Curtis. 
And uh, he said, hey, let's talk about color computer joysticks and game control. So I interviewed Curtis, and that was great. Uh, my first interview, I've never inter interviewed anybody before. That was in November. Um, and fast forward, my first celebrity interview with Rick Adams right here. Uh, we interviewed Rick in March of 2016, and that was pretty cool. A lot of these things are happening very much like pinch me moments. Like, you know, I was a kid who bought the game, so now the people who made the games are aware that I exist and are letting me interview them and things like that. So it was very cool. So Rick being my first color computer game developer interview in March of 2016, um, going to Cocoa Fest for the first time, the 25th uh, annual Last Chicago for Cocoa Fest, not even knowing they've been going on for 24 years before that. So that was very cool. Um, Joel Adams' son, uh, excuse me, Joel, but Rick Adams' son, Joel Adams, reached out to me through the internet um, and said, I'd like to do some artwork for, for you. I'll show you those slides here in just a minute. So that was cool, looking up with Joel. Um, starting our live talk show we have now, shameful plug, Coco Talk, uh, which is a weekly live talk show on the internet uh, featuring the Tandy Color Computer. That was a cool moment. Coco Fest this year, and of course now being here at Kennedy Sunday. These are some highlights of a lot of things that have happened in this past two and a half years. It's been like a crazy train ride. But some other things that have been really cool too to be a, a fly on the wall is this is a brand new game for the Color Computer 3 called uh, Popstar Pilot. This came out last year in November of 2016. Nick Marekis from Australia developed this. I was a fly on the wall in the development of this and I was a game tester for this and I'm even credited on the back of the package. So that's again, instrument. That's pretty cool, right? And Rick Adams, brand new game, Bob Fred, which by the way I need an autograph. Um, I kind of got to beta test some of this while this was happening. I was kind of in the mix when this whole thing came together where we're going to make this new game. So again, another kind of pinch me moment. So there's been a lot of cool things that have happened just by randomly deciding to do YouTube and just deciding to do color computer videos of all things. Um, it's been a very, very cool ride. So there's been a lot of cool things. It's hard to remember them all. I know I'm forgetting a lot. I'm old. Um, but another thing I did which really struck me by surprise too is because I programmed in BASIC as a kid. Uh, and that's the only language I've ever learned. I've never learned really another language. But on the COCO, I programmed the BASIC throughout the 80s. Because it was Microsoft BASIC, that transitioned to Windows very easily. So I programmed in Quick BASIC and DOS through the 90s. So I've programmed in BASIC for about 20 years. I'm fairly familiar with BASIC. I started doing a series on how to program in BASIC, which I haven't finished because of a lot of projects you're trying to manage all your time, right? So, I've been doing this series, and I thought I was doing this for the kids, because I had a lot of kids watching my videos because of Minecraft and stuff. I'm like, hey kids, there was once this thing called BASIC, and you know, when I was your age, I was able to make little games, let me show you how that works. And so that was my intention, but it turns out more adults are watching this than kids were, and so my, my, my goal with this, which I'm two years behind schedule, but my goal was this, finish the series, because I'm going by the book, chapter by chapter, finish the book, document the how-to program in BASIC, I'm going to write a handful of basic games. These are going to be my projects. I'm going to have all these new original games I'm going to create, release them. Um, then I'm going to Disney World. No, but then I want to learn assembly, write games in assembly, because I never learned it. So now it's like one of these bucket list things. I want to learn assembly. I'm going to make games in assembly. And now that we have the ability to put games on ROM cartridges, I eventually hope to have a color computer game in a cartridge. And that's going to be like full circle. You notice like where I started from. That's my goal. So hopefully by next year that will happen. So this has been a really cool, fun thing. I'm way behind on this. I was hoping to have the, the book done and at least give you guys a um, like a teaser of what my project is going to be. And I, I don't, I'm not that far yet. So I'm behind there. But that's fun. This is in the works, right? Lots of projects in the works. So where did gameplay goodness come? Where's my room? Mike Rome's not here. Okay, so yeah. Mike Rome's running around. Mike Rome of the Coco Crew podcast. So uh, Mike Rowan took a sound bite from one of my videos, turned that into like a rap song, which they aired on the podcast. It was a really cool song, and so I turned that into a music video. And so now um, that's like now going to be my little intro and outro thing is this song, and you can hear it at my table if you want. So that's why this little presentation is called Game Play Goodness. So it's really interesting how all these interconnecting things happen. So. Um, let's fast forward to now Joel Adams. So Joel Adams, son of Rick Adams, reached out to me and said, I want to make artwork for you. I want to go back to this branding and consistency. So on the top here you see that is now like the banner for my Facebook page and my Twitter page and my YouTube channel. Right? So a nice consistent branding um, of that. 
When Joe showed me his artwork, and he does a lot of stuff on Instagram, he draws it all out of pen and ink, it's really cool stuff. I said, Joel, we gotta take your pictures and we gotta put these things on t-shirts because his, his artwork is amazing. And so we took a lot of Joel's designs, and this is the cool thing about the internet, you know, I can make Joel drew the Coco Top logo, these I'm a coconut t-shirts he did that Brendan's wearing and, and Grant and, and Rick's wearing. So Joel's drawing all these things. And we've turned that into all these different designs now. And on the internet, you can do all this stuff, right? So you can order a t-shirt or a coffee mug with these cool retro images, and I don't have to make them or, or print them or put them on a shelf or pay for them. It's just like this on-demand publishing now. So I technically have a merchandise store that, you know, if more people knew about it, it might actually make me money, but it's just more about this is cool stuff that is all custom stuff, you know, custom hand-drawn images that we've done. So that's been another interesting thing that's happened on the journey. Um, another thing I did for Coco Fest was I took a lot of my videos and I put them on DVDs. And again, these are things you can all do online. You can create products and sell them online. You never have to produce the thing yourself. So I've got a couple of DVDs that are all available. And now the Retro Swag Shop is its own web shop. And it's like your app store. I'm hoping to scale it to something possibly bigger. Um, it's just more of a of a, you know, an idea, so we have that going on. Um, and then I want to talk about our show now, Coco Talk. Another thing that's very, everything that's happened has been unplanned, um, unexpected. The, the way YouTube, YouTube blew up because of the color computer, of all things, the most obscure thing you would expect it to do. But um, getting ready for Coco Fest this year in April, we started doing a live talk where we're basically saying, damn, it's like, you know, the week before Christmas. We're so excited about going to Cocoa Fest. Let's talk about it. What are we excited about saying? What are we excited about doing? And we did that for four weeks leading up to Cocoa Fest. And I'm like, all right, this is going to run out of gas. We're going to run out of things to talk about. Um, surprisingly, six and a half months later, we haven't run out of things to talk about. So we are running weekly, every Saturday live, we're running somewhere between two to four hour talk show on the internet that several dozen people tune in live to watch, and then throughout the week, another 200 or more will uh, watch on replays on YouTube. So the fact that several dozen that participate, several dozen that participate, okay, several dozen that participate, and then several dozen more in the live audience. Right? Right. So, um, and so that's been interesting. And so we're getting, a, you know, close to a thousand views a week, some a thousand views a month on YouTube on this obscure talk show with a bunch of old guys talking about an old computer. So that's interesting. And that led to, all right, well, let's make this a podcast. And so now it's also a weekly podcast where it's basically take the same show, edit it down to audio, and it's now a podcast. And I, I didn't think that was going to have any value or benefit to anybody, but it turns out a lot of people say, I like the fact that I can listen to it because it's hard for me to watch YouTube, but if I'm in the car, I can listen to it in the car. So it turns out that people actually like the fact that it's a podcast. So now, by complete accident, I'm also a podcaster. And, and as John knows, that's when the big bucks come in, right? So, <laughs> all the, women. <laughs> the women, the money, the cars. <laughs> but again, it's been an unexpected journey. And all these things are things I'm, I'm grateful for, I'm blown away by, um, things like that. So it's been an interesting ride. Um, and, and I'm now at a point where I'm currently managing four websites. Right? I have my website, which is basically just telling you all the crap I do. I created this website here called amacoconut.com because uh, it started off as a page of links because as I was learning about the color computer, I'm like, well, let me just create a page so I don't have to bookmark everything and forget out. That page got to be too big, so it's now a site, and this has become a resource. I'm trying to do this as a community service for it. If you want to know about the color computer, go here. It's probably here. And if you're doing a project, let us know, and we'll put it there. Right? So I'm trying to make this as a community hub for all things Coco, uh, free of charge. You know, if you have something you want listed, I'll list it for you. I don't care. Um, the fact that we now have merchandise, I've got a cool little um, domain name for that, 8bit. Um, I love it. Some of you will get it. Um, and so that's my swag shop. And we even have a little website for Coco Talk just to link to the podcast and the replays and things like that. So, yeah, so I'm currently now also maintaining not one but four websites and having to learn all of the logistics of WordPress and artworks and plugins and templates and all these fun things. So, um, been a, a fun, wild ride. Um, and so now I bring you to my plans for my channels. Plural, because on the top, 
is my original channel that was called The Original Gamer Stevie Stro, and it was basically a fluster club of content. There was just a ton of stuff on there. I've got retro, I've got arcade games, console games, old computer games, Minecraft videos, color computer videos, interviews. I have so much stuff there, so I decided to break my channel into three channels. So, and well, I'm not there yet, but these are my plans. So my original channel called Original Gamer Stevie Stro will be basically all 70s, 80s, 90s video game content except Coco stuff. Uh, I've created a brand new YouTube channel called I'm a Coconut that is going to be dedicated to nothing but Coco content. So I'm going to move all my 200 plus gameplay videos there. I'm going to move Coco Talk to the to live stream there. I've got over a dozen interviews I've done with all the um, game developers from the past to the present. Those will get moved, new ones will go there. And then I'm going to open up, I'll have a third channel that was originally meant to be my uncensored channel that I never used. I'm going to change the name, but that's where I'm going to put a new game. So I'm going to have an old game channel, Color computer channel and a new game channel, and, and not just be a big bag, a mixed bag of things. So I think there's just too much. So I do plan to kind of diversify there. So it's been an interesting journey. It's been two and a half years of meeting people, doing things, um, experiencing things, and reliving my past and seeing that there is a future for the computer that I grew up with. Some of you, it was the Model 1. For me, it was the color computer. So it's like that first thing that gave you that spark of inspiration um, that, for lack of a better term, made you who you are today, because that was what that was for me. So the fact that I've always had that sentimental value for the color computer, and I know that there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of people around the world who still love this machine, and I'm friends with hundreds of these people, and I see hundreds of them now in person at Coco Fest and Tandy Assembly, and you've become a community. I know it's a cliche word, but it really is kind of like a community, especially when you get together like this. It's been amazing. And so, uh, and the irony of all of this is when I volunteered to speak, is Coco Fest was a twinkle in someone's eye, and there wasn't a list of anybody. Now, when you have somebody like Don French, or you have all these people, it's like, dude, why am I even here? But at least I volunteered a long time ago. And stuff. So, who was this schmuck? Why is he here? But, yeah, so, um, but yeah, no, it's just amazing. By the way, a big round of applause to all the coordinators of Tandy Assembly. Yeah. This is a truly amazing event, and I think that speaks to the power of our of our nostalgia, our passion, and, and our sense of community. So, um, I've done a lot of things that I never would have imagined doing. Um, I've got a lot of ideas, I've got a lot of plans, and, and so as much as I feel I've done, I know I haven't scratched the surface of what I want to do. So all I can say is, is that look out, because you ain't seen nothing yet. So that is all I have to say about that. Um, and other than that, the, uh, any questions part of this presentation? <laughs> yeah. Yes, Jay. So I just wonder, um, when you started, was it just kind of like uh, throwing out a wall and seeing what stick, or did you actually have a plan for what you want to do? Uh, I had a general plan. We started because my kids wanted to do Minecraft videos, and I figured we would do that. Actually, the irony of it is my plan for Minecraft was pretty elaborate. It was something that, to this day, I don't think anybody's doing. But I bought all new computers for me and my kids because they were all into it. I wanted to record three different sessions at the same time and edit them into a multi-camera shoot, or it was going to be more cinematic. And I thought this was really cool. My kids were like, Dad, that's stupid. That's complicated. Nobody's going to understand it. And they kind of lost interest. So that's another irony. I'm the 50-year-old guy still playing Minecraft. My kids are old and 60 years old. I'm not playing Minecraft anymore. You know what I mean? so, um, so there was a basic plan to do that, to do something different. Like a family, literal family of people playing Minecraft together. Um, that was my initial plan. I also knew I wanted to do retro. I, so I was doing stuff in Maine. And I knew I wanted to eventually do Coco. That was as far as I thought it through when I first started. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have a day job soon? I have two jobs. I'm self-employed around my own IT management, and I teach IT certifications at night. And I have a family, uh, a wife, two kids, a dog, a cat, a mortgage payment, two vehicles, uh, and then I try to do YouTube. It's and a yeah, YouTube, four websites, live talk show, you know, have a retro hobby. So. <laughs> Uh, cool. Well, thank you guys for being in here. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, what is your name, sir? Grant. Grant. <laughs> Grant. And, and, uh, by the way, where'd you get that awesome shirt, man? You were going to stand on our show, by the way. This is Grant Levy. He's on our show. 
he does a segment that's called the newbie question of the week that gets a bunch of other people to pontificate for hours at length uh, to answer his question. Yeah. So, what do you ask about monitors that one? That went on for it. <laughs> <laughs> you, missed, you missed the last one. Yeah, I didn't get the catch for me. The reason why I picked the 2 o'clock start time was two reasons. Because um, for most of the world, it kind of works, other than Simon. Um, Simon's in Australia, not Simon, but Nick Marendis is in Australia, and it's, it's 4 a.m. for him. But most people in the world, it's, it's an okay time. But the other thing is, I figure if I start at 2, I've got to be done by dinner. I want to be out of here because I want to eat. I want to see my family because I've been locked in my room for four hours at this point. Uh, so i got to start early enough where we can be done by dinner time. It typically runs dinner months late at this point. Now, so, um, but that was my, one of my thoughts to be in. So what was your question, Graham? Actually, this comes from uh, David Ladd. David Ladd. Uh, oh, David Ladd, who was just recently on the Cocoa Group podcast. Correct. International celebrity, David Ladd. Floppy, <laughs> floppy talk, David Ladd. Yes. He wants to know why you pick on him so much. And I mean, because it's easy. <laughs> David Ladd, Floppy's Rule. <laughs> so if you haven't got yourself a copy of Bomb Threat, make sure you get one of these things here. The fact that we have injection molded brand new cartridges is amazing. Because even Atari H doesn't have these. They're taking old ET cartridges and recycling them. <laughs> <laughs> they make their cartridges. Yeah, I think they have to dig them all out of New Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got brand new injection. It's a great time to be in the Cocoa Hobbies and you can make brand new cartridges. Yes, yes. Um, so how much do you have to do battle with YouTube? Uh, random. So yeah, so how about done battle? So he's asking how much battle did YouTube. So YouTube, we've been talking, you guys were talking about copyrights, right? So um, where does copyrights come in? Copyrights typically come in if you're playing music that is copyrighted. And as I found out, even if you're just playing video content, that can be copyrighted. And so there's random things in their algorithms. And we had this conversation in our 14-hour drive here where we were talking about artificial intelligence and when will it take over the world. Um, and we've already seen that artificial intelligence and algorithms is already screwing things up. So we don't want artificial intelligence running the world. But um, so YouTube, um, when you are doing your own YouTube channel, you can do what's called monetizing your channel where you get ad revenue. In case you're wondering, it's one-tenth of one penny per view. So it takes 10 views to equal one penny. Um, so, as you can tell here, it, it doesn't rain, but sometimes it's prints. Um, but, and the minute you've decided to become a YouTube partner and you want to make money from them, anything you do can and will be used against you. So if you're doing anything that's copyrighted, whoever claims copyright to that audio or video content, they now own your video, and they own all the revenue capability of that video. And I've had that happen to me a few different times, where one of our live streams, I did a little segment where I did a parody of the Will Smith thing from Saturday Night Live where they did the I Need More Cowbell. And so I did that cowbell sketch and I used some of the video from there. NBC Universal shut down the video. It's a three and a half hour video with a minute and a half of their footage that I now no longer have access to. So there are some problems with that. Uh, and, I, and I can't download that video, I can't do anything. So it's like I lost my video because Evil Corp says no. Yeah. Right? So there are certain downsides to that. I understand and, and, and respect the fact that you want to protect intellectual property. If it was my copyright, I would want it respected. But I'm a little guy. They're not, a, they're not looking out for the little guy, they're looking out for getting sued. Right? And so their algorithms are safer than suck, you know, for better or for worse. There is a dispute process, but it's just it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I think I think most of us who do this retro hobby, especially if you're podcasting or something like that, you're not doing it for the money. Like I was thinking about you guys when you were doing your fucking at your app store. Everything is free, so you're not doing this for the money, right? I'm uh, doing it for the love. Now maybe there are plans down the road. You know, phase three, phase four. There might be a way to, you know, capitalize on that infrastructure when it's, when it's in place. But you want to just do it for the genuine love of doing that, and that's why I do what I do, but I am an entrepreneur, and uh, you mentioned do I have a job. I have two jobs, and the only reason why this is in the back of my mind is that there, my kids watch the most ridiculous things on YouTube, and these people are literally millionaires, literally millionaires, because you can look at their view count, do the math, divide that by one tenth of one cent, and know they're still making a thousand dollars a day, or better, on their Excuse my French. Bullshit videos. So <laughs> I'm like, my stuff isn't complete bullshit. It's kind of 
crappy, but it's not too bad. And so they can solve it. And somebody else would look at a Coco video and say, that's stupid. But there's a lot of me crap on YouTube that's making a lot of people a lot of money. So my dream would be, I now know what I want to do when I grow up. I would just like to be able to do this and just have it pay my bills. I don't want to be a millionaire. But if I could focus on doing this and spend 8 to 16 hours a day trying to create new content, come up with new ideas, put it back out there, that would be my dream come true. So could I get to that level? Possibly. I'm, I'm not going to stop. And maybe I will. In the meantime, I'm doing it for the right reasons. I'm putting my heart into what I hope is quality of content. And if I happen to make money in the process, then that's a bonus, right? So, um, One more question. Yes. This comes from Curtis Boyle. Who is that? <laughs> you should know who he is. Uh, he is asking where you find going to make it past level two on a star pilot. Ah, <laughs> um, good question. We find maybe not. I have him running on my coat. We'll try it. Right, so. <laughs> cool. But thanks, thanks for having me, guys. It's an honor to be here at this first ever monumentous occasion. Hopefully, the first of hundreds. Well, hopefully, <laughs> 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 our grandchildren are still carrying on candy assembly. That'd be awesome. Thanks. And, and uh, so at my table, you'll see Pop Star Pilot, you'll see a Coco. Um, I have business cards, so if you want to get a t shirt drawn by a local artist, I uh, guess you can grab the business cards and get a t shirt, something like that, and take a look at get some samples and stuff. Thank you. Is that